Mary. I'm the program director for the Wound Center at Holy Family. No, we're not going to be talking about wounds. You're at the right place. Um, we're talking about the late effects of radiation therapy. And part of what we do at Holy Family at the Wound Center is we have hyperbaric oxygen therapy uh, chambers. So that's what we're going to talk about tonight and specifically how it relates to radiation treatment and the um, late effects of that. So I have two wonderful people with me, um, Deb Calvarisi and Dr. Frischman. And they are part of our team at Holy Family. Deb's our clinical nurse manager and Dr. Frischman's our medical director. And they both have a lot of experience when it comes to wound care and dealing with patients with um, radiation and getting those patients healed and in the chamber. So um, without further ado, they're just gonna, they're gonna hop back and forth a little bit. Um, but like I said, we're a very casual group. If you have a question, raise your hand, you know, that type of thing. So. Um, we're going to talk about the late effects of radiation and how hyperbaric oxygen therapy can help. And you're going to hear us refer to the hyperbaric oxygen as HBO. That's what it's commonly referred to. Okay. So first of all, let's talk about radiation injuries. There's acute injuries which happen in the like weeks, just days to weeks after having the radiation, which is your skin conditions, the burning, um, it could be a drop in your blood cells, um, nausea, vomiting, sometimes dizziness or headaches. The thing that we want to address though is the chronic or the late effects of the radiation, which could appear actually years after the fact. So it could be five years, seven years, 10 years after the radiation um, that these kind of effects can occur. Osteoradionecrosis and soft tissue radionecrosis are those two conditions that we're talking about. Um, and the thing that I wanted to point out, there's a lot of words and a lot of numbers on here, but with the statistics, it comes to about 50,000 people a year that are actually diagnosed with either osteoradionecrosis or soft tissue radionecrosis. Um, Dr. Frischman's going to go through both of those in a lot more detail, but just to give you a kind of broad overview, the ORN or the osteoradionecrosis has to do with bone. So the most common place that we see that is the jaw. So somebody has some kind of um, head or neck radiation, it can actually damage the, the jaw bone and years down the line you need a tooth pulled the dentist or that oral surgeon will say, they'll do an x-ray and they'll look and they'll say, you know, there's something not right with that bone. The bone is, you know, deteriorating. And that's when they'll send you actually for hyperbaric before they'll uh, pull that tooth. The soft tissue radionecrosis can happen anywhere in the body. Um, it's very common though that we see it after somebody has had like abdominal or pelvic radiation where we'll see cystitis, proctitis. Um, so it could be painful, bloody, um, urine or stool, incontinence of those areas. Um, and also nerve damage. Is this where you take over? Carry on. Um, the injury begins with the initial radiation, and there's some discussion as to whether or not the acute injury has anything to do with the late injury, and some of the changes that may occur early may go away, and then these late changes are a sequela of it, or that it's an ongoing process that goes throughout the whole thing. And some of the things that we know that happen is that there are different cytokines are these kind of uh, messengers that the cells tell each other um, to either make inflammation or scar, which is fibrosis. Um, and that can lead to damage of the tissue um, or more specifically, the blood vessels. And that's one of the major areas that becomes problematic with this kind of injury is that the blood vessels themselves get inflamed and they can block off or they can get fibrosed scarred and close off. So the, the vasculature to these tissues becomes injured as well. Um, there are some other things to consider about the different kind of cell types that come into the different tissues. We'll talk a little bit about that later. Got it. Um, oh. I think 
think I missed one. Um, so for osteoradionecrosis, I'm going to talk about some individual parts of the, the body. And as she mentioned, the osteoradionecrosis is the damage that happens to bone. And probably 90% of the time, we're talking about the jawbone um, with radiation from head and neck cancers. Um, it can go from, and there's different staging systems, but essentially what she had mentioned about an x-ray showing some abnormalities to actually having bone showing in the gum line all the way up to and including where there'll be a tract where you can see the bone through the skin and not even just through the oral uh, mucosa. Um, and one of the classification systems actually happens to do with how it responds, and that's this Marks protocol, which I'll talk about a little bit later. Uh, so for conventional treatments of this osteoradionecrosis, nutrition is important, of course, you know, for cancer patients in general with the chemotherapy and whatever else is going on in their body, that's going to be an important part of healing. Um, antibiotics, and my specialty before wound uh, is infectious diseases. Um, and I have treated a couple patients with a specific bacteria that we worry about in the jaw, and that kind of goes hand in hand with some of the other treatments that we'll do for these people. Um, debriding the bone, or cleaning out dead, devitalized bone, that has to be done, but there's also a caveat to it. And, and um, Deb had mentioned a little bit about perhaps protecting it before you do these things. Um, and that includes the hyperbarics and the cleaning of the bone and perhaps antibiotics and whatever else is going on in there. Um, and so all this goes up to and includes removing that entire chunk of bone and this free tissue transfer that they're mentioning there is either a piece of cadaveric bone or a piece of bone in your body and you actually put it in place of what you've taken away. And then there's pharmacotherapies, the different medicines, and they mention here the pentoxifeline, um, which helps to improve blood flow or bisphosphonates, which can help strengthen bone itself. Um, and vitamin E. So the second area um, would be this proctitis or enteritis. Now if you don't do or don't know, if you throw itis on the end of something, it means that thing is inflamed. Um, so for proctitis, I've heard of proctology, that's the rectum, enteritis is the intestines. Um, and so for people who've had radiation to this part of the body, these are the things that can happen. And um, you see that up to 30% of the patients can develop these problems to one extent or another. It's a continuum, of course. Um, and what you might experience is irritation, um, which would kind of give you uh, either bloody diarrhea or the feeling that you have to go to the bathroom all the time or just general pain down in the pelvic area. Um, the kind of the more extreme uh, complications are these fistulas, um, which is an abnormal connection between different organs. So it is possible that the colon could make a tube that would go to the bladder or the vagina. And those two areas would be connected when they shouldn't have. Um, they ha do have, oh, I should point it that way. Uh, this this x-ray here on the right actually shows that I don't know if you can make it out, but um, that's colon on your right and this small track that goes to this kind of half moon thing is what I think is the bladder. And there's this connection that's going between those two things. Um, so again, for the treatment, not including HBO, um, could include medicines like steroids to help decrease the inflammation. Um, and then kind of cauterizing treatments, so either laser or coagulation, um, different kind of you know uh, medications that help clot the blood so that there's no more bleeding in there. And again, surgery to remove that tissue, um, which is, again, can be problematic because this is unhealthy tissue from the radiation to begin with. They prefer not to go in on patients that have these problems. Uh, and then the, the third place is cystitis, again, that itis. And this is the bladder. Um, actually, we're treating someone right now who has cystitis and prostatitis, so it kind of goes a little hand in hand. When yeah. you say 10% there and 30% on the previous slide, mm -hmm. is that 10% of the 750 
50,000 or is that 10% of the 50,000? I, I think those are 10% of the whole. And then, again, it's a continuum with how many people are actually overly symptomatic where they need to see somebody about it. So, um, and again, the timing, as they mentioned here, several months to several years after the injury itself. Um, so for cystitis, that inflammation, and if you know a bladder infection is also called cystitis, so it's going to be very similar. You may have frequency of urination, urgency of urination, um, painful urinating, sometimes going to the bathroom at night, um, and pelvic pain again. Uh, one of the more difficult things to deal with there is the bleeding, and sometimes the can be a, a fair amount of clots that come out and, and it can block the tubes and whatnot. Um, and so with that, some of the treatments um, for the, the second bullet point is to irrigate it and get those clots out of there or to um, put agents into the bladder that will help uh, quell the bleeding and everything up until uh, actually removing the urine flow through the bladder. You know, so you can divert the urine either to a receptacle and you can remove the bladder completely um, or tubes that actually go into the kidneys through the skin. And again, some just Band-Aid type treatments, you know, to stop the spasming um, like uh, muscle relaxants and, and bladder uh, uh, pain medicines. Um, yep, there we go. Uh, and the, the slides are little bit busy, um, but they're also going to be up on somewhere where people could read them if they wanted to. So it's more complete than what usual. Now, this is kind of looking at where you would go to, you know, if a patient had these problems. And so for osteoenorrhea necrosis, uh, and we talked about some of the symptoms and the problems you can have in the mouth. Well, they're probably seeing their dentist or their oral surgeon to begin with, and they'll do the conventional treatments, and if that isn't working after a certain amount of months, and most often uh, those kind of doctors understand that this is a problem, and they know that hyperbaric treatment is one of the adjuncts to help treat these patients. In fact, for the jaw, it's probably the most common reason for people to come to uh, the hyperbaric chambers for radiation injury. Um, I'll point out a little bit later, we were talking about prevention if you need dental work afterwards, and th that'll come. Uh, and the next is a similar flow chart, but for soft tissue injury. Again, it depends on the area of the body and which physician may be kind of the person that's holding the red flag. You know, so if it's a gastroenterologist for bleeding and tenismus, or you know, that feeling of urgency all the time when you have to go to the bathroom, or a urologist, or maybe your internist you know, that you're talking to, and certainly they may not be as attuned uh, to this as perhaps an oral surgeon when they're looking at the mouth. They're probably a little more well-versed in that. Um, so now going back to prevention, you know, with the jaw, the treatment can be, because there is osteoenorrhea necrosis, and to try and heal that, because these ulcers can happen spontaneously. Or if you know dental work needs to be done, and if you're a dentist and you've had the patient fill out their questionnaire and they've had radiation in the past, they also understand that before they do any work in there, that they'll want the hyperbaric oxygen to come in and help out so that there won't be further damage and problems healing afterwards. Um, I think the one... Slide, no, no, it'll be the next one. Um, so before going for the surgery, you'll do a certain amount of treatments, and here it says 20, I think it's 20 to 30, uh, and then you'll have the surgery, whatever that happens to be, if it's just pulling a tooth or whatnot, and then a few more treatments, and that will help ensure that the, the treatment will take and that you won't have further complications because of the trauma that happened with it. Um, now, just a word on the studies, and again, this is probably the most common thing, there's been a lot of case series that have shown this to be beneficial, and 
um, a couple that didn't. You know, if you want to, we can talk about you know the balance of that. Um, the science behind this is not crystal clear. Um, it's we think, knowing that the vasculature is one of the problems, hyperbaric oxygen does help angiogenesis, which is the growth of new blood vessels. Um, it also helps with stem cell mobilization. So that was one of the things I kind of touched on before. But tissues also have stem cells. You may have heard that with bone marrow. And this is bone, but it's not actually the bone marrow part that we're talking about here. It's the tissue part of the bone. Like if you're in the bladder and the, the bowel, there's also stem cells in these areas. And there's some theories that the hyperbarics will help have those regenerate as well. Because these are tissues that are having problems regenerating themselves, themselves because of the radiation. Um, and then again, reducing this fibrosis, all that scarring that was going on in there. Um, and then now with the HBO and the enteritis and proctitis, uh, again, there's been a number of studies from them. And they have different um, categories of how people have responded, either no response, partial response, or cure. And 80% in these studies have shown some benefit. And again, for some people, it's complete. Other people, it was partial. And that's what they were looking for, you know, that uh, they're not looking for the next bathroom everywhere that they're going, you know, when they're traveling out and whatnot. Um, and the same thing with the, the cystitis. Uh, again, about 20 studies. And they showed 75% of the patients who had resolution of their symptoms. And sometimes, and I've uh, heard, um, where people have had the, the bleeding, they've had their therapy, things went well. And then two years later, it's come back again, and they retreat to solve those problems. Um, that's the chamber. And Deb's going to talk about the chamber a little bit. <laughs> That is what the chamber looks like. <clears throat> and I'm going to talk about um, what we actually do because you are totally put in this chamber. Some people come in thinking that it's only going to be their head going in or it's only going to be the lower half of their body going in or something like that. You are put in the chamber, the door is closed, and you are in there for approximately two to two and a half hours depending on what pressure we bring you to, OK? That's determined by the type of um, the protocol that we're using, whether it's for the osteoradionecrosis or the soft tissue radionecrosis. Um, and you'll see here it says the treatment pressure is 2 to 2.5 ATA for approximately 90 to 120 minutes, respectively. That's at pressure. So once we get you in there, we have to pressurize the tank. We keep you at that pressure for the 90 to 120 minutes, and then we have to depressurize the tank. The thing that most people um, talk about or feel when they're in there is the pressure in their ears. So just the same way you would feel that pressure when you go on a plane, um, it's kind of the same thing. We travel. We call it traveling when we're increasing or decreasing the pressure. Um, and like I said, we go to 2 or 2.5, depending on the protocol. Um, on an airplane, it's generally about 1.6 ATA. So that pressure is a little bit greater. Um, that's something that before you even have HBO, you would come to a HBO center and get evaluated by a physician to make sure that you would qualify. Number one, that you have some kind of indication that we think that we can help. And then number two, that you don't have any kind of comorbidities that would make it possibly um, a dangerous situation to put you into the hyperbarics. Um, and then the number of treatments is typically 30 to 40 treatments. And it's five days a week. It's Monday through Friday for the 30 to 40 treatments. Um, before I even get into the conclusions, the, I do want to share a few stories of people that we've personally treated at the wound care center. Um, the first one was an osteoradionecrosis. 
he was actually referred by his oral surgeon. And this was literally, we've been open since 2011, by the way. Um, it was shortly after we opened, and at the time, his oral surgeon only knew of the hyperbarics at Lutheran General Hospital. They have a different type of um, chamber. It's a multi-place chamber, multiple people go in at one time. Our chamber is just one person at a time. It's better for infection control purposes. Um, however, he went there and couldn't find where their HBO department was was frustrated that day, happened to get in his car, and he was driving home and passed by Holy Family and saw a sign that we had it. Came in, came and talked to us, and then we talked to his oral surgeon. We started and finished his treatment by us. We did 30 treatments prior to his tooth being pulled, and he had had, um, I think it was tonsil cancer, if I'm remembering correctly. 10 years prior, he had had the radiation and um, he needed a tooth pulled. The oral surgeon did the x-ray, said that there was osteoradionecrosis, wanted the 30 treatments, pulled the, the tooth after the 30, and that was, he pulled it on a Friday, and the gentleman came back on Monday and completed 10 more treatments. The report from the oral surgeon said he had bleeding that was consistent with somebody that had never had radiation. So that's telling us that that was increasing that, those blood vessels to that bone. He did not lose any bone in that area. Another gentleman that we were treating, um, and I know I'm going to say it wrong, xerostomia, um, where you have a lack of uh, saliva after radiation because that radiation affects those salivary glands. And this gentleman was having such a hard time eating. He was losing weight and could not eat. I mean, it would have to be blending his food and stuff like that. And so, he came to us for possibly treating him. And with that treatment, he was able to now eat solid food. He still had to help like drink things in between. It didn't totally you know, make the salivary glands reproduce like somebody that had never had radiation. But it did make it so that he could eat solid food instead of having to blend everything. Um, and as Dr. Frischman referred to right now, we're treating a gentleman with the radiation-induced cystitis, came to us because it was painful, bloody urination. And he is seeing some improvement, but he's in the middle of the treatment right now. So um, we had another gentleman, his was um, where he was having diarrhea. Okay, So his was the proctitis. With that particular gentleman, he was claustrophobic. And even with medication to kind of calm his nerves, he only did about three treatments and said, I can't do this anymore. So if I go back to that picture of that chamber, you can see it's an enclosed space. This, though, right above it is a TV. So you can watch TV. It plays DVDs. You can bring DVDs in and watch a movie while you're in there, which is what a lot of people do. Or you can just take a nap. We keep the lights in that room low so that you can nap in there. And there's always somebody right next to that chamber in that room. So this way, in case you have a problem, you say, you know what, I'm not feeling that good. I need to come out. Whatever the case may be, somebody's right there. Okay? We can hear you all the time. We get to talk to you with a little kind of walkie-talkie type thing that we pick up and use to talk to you. So. Does anybody have any questions before I go on? Yes. A very obvious question. What do you do about bandages? We give you either a urinal or a bedpan. We pad up the bed very well in case you are having the diarrhea um, and you can't get that bedpan underneath you because it's not like we can take you out during the middle of the treatment. It takes a good 15 to 20 minutes to get you to pressure and 15 to 20 minutes to bring you back from pressure. Um, the other thing too, another obvious question is people say, well, if the person before me had that diarrhea or urinary incontinence or something in that chamber, what do you do about it? We actually clean that whole chamber. Our HBO tech goes in, cleans the whole thing out with a special disinfectant in between every patient. Okay. 
Right, you won't. Anything else? Yes, they are. Um, we will, though, always check insurance. We check what the, um, if it's a Medicare, we'll check the LCDs to make sure that you meet the qualifications. Um, for example, with the, both of these indications, we need to get your records to find out how many rads of radiation that you've already received. Um, and so that's something that we have to have in our records to, to prove this in case your insurance company came back or Medicare came back and said, well, why did you put them in the tank for 30 times to be able to pay that? We have to have that information. So we make sure that all of that is put together before we actually put somebody in the tank. So it's not like you come to us and that day or the next day we're starting treatment. Generally, it's, I would say anywhere from about 10 days to two weeks because we have to request the records from whatever hospital you receive the radiation at. We're requesting um, information from your primary care physician for lab results, um, chest x-rays, EKGs, things like that. Because as I said before, that pressure, we want to make sure that you're safe to go into the tank. Yes? Um, Um, if you're diabetic, then your blood sugar can drop. So that's something that if you're diabetic, we are checking your blood sugar before and after you come, you know, before you go in and after you come out of the tank. If your blood sugar drops too low, obviously you can have a seizure in there. The other thing is you can have a seizure from oxygen toxicity. If you're in the tank for the 2.5 ATA, it's a longer time period. You're in there for two hours. Um, then you're also getting what we call an air break. So you would actually, we would tell you, okay, it's time for the air break. You're going to take what looks like an oxygen mask and put it over your face. And then during that air break, you're actually breathing room air. It's actually a switch that we turn on so that through this mask, you're breathing room air to help to decrease the amount of oxygen. It's kind of like just a little break and would prevent any kind of or help prevent any kind of seizures. The most obvious, um, I don't know if you want to call it side effect, is the claustrophobia. And we've treated several people with claustrophobia in there. Um, sometimes it's just a matter of having them lay down on the gurney and kind of sliding it in there. We had one woman that was so extremely claustrophobic that it, as soon as we slid her in, she said, get me out, get me out. We pulled her right out again. She came back the next day. We did it again. She allowed us to shut the door. She said, okay, now take me out. She came back the next day. She was able to stay in there for 10 minutes. So it was a gradual process, and she was also given anti-anxiety medication for that because she really did need the treatment. Hers was a wound problem, though, not the um, soft tissue or, or osteoradionecrosis. Um, the other thing is what we call barotrauma. And I referred to it before with the pressure in the ears. Um, you feel that pressure when you go on a plane. If we travel too quickly, we could actually rupture a eardrum. We've never had that happen at our center, and it's a very small you know, percentage um, that it does happen to. Before you go into the tank and after you come out, again, that is something that we are looking at your tympanic membranes to make sure that everything looks good. A physician, a nurse looks at it before and after automatically. A physician will look at it with your first, say, three to five treatments, they'll look at it before. And then after that, when they know that your, you know, your eardrums look good, it doesn't look like there's any problems, then it could be before or after. Um, I did refer to you know, chest x-rays, EKGs, that kind of thing. Again, that has to do with the barotrauma. If you had a chest tube for some reason three months ago, they want to make sure that that's totally healed and that everything looks good there before we put you in because we don't want to create a problem with your lungs then. Okay, Those are the most common um, side effects. You can have some vision changes, um, but the vision changes are temporary. So we always recommend that you don't 
get any kind of prescriptive lenses, whether it be contacts or glasses, during that time while you're being treated either, to wait till afterwards, about six weeks afterwards, actually. When you go up in an airplane, you're, you're actually going under reduced pressure, right? The, the, your your pressure is the higher than the outside, but it's a reduced pressure, is that right? Yeah, so it's while you're coming down that you'll feel the same thing as you would feel. Okay. But this is actually just increasing the pressure, right? This is like increasing the pyramid pressure or the, or the number lock. What's it so doing? It's like going, it's like diving in water, kind of. You know, if you're going down, actually, I think 17 feet is uh, 1 atm. So it's, so it's increasing, increasing the right. atmospheric pressure, basically. What it's right. specifically doing is increasing the partial pressure of oxygen within your blood, and then that's available for your tissue. So it's like bathing your tissue and, and then enhanced oxygen Correct. and that speeds up healing. Is that? That's, that's part of it, yeah. Jeff, I like your soda thing. Okay, uh, soda I, will, I will tell that too. But um, also the other thing is normally our blood vessels, our oxygen is carried by our, blood, our red blood cells and it can carry 21% oxygen. Um, when you go into the hyperbaric, this is where Mary's talking about my soda, uh, can and this is how I like to kind of describe it when we have students and people coming through just for tours um, is if you think of this as a can of pop okay obviously the outside is the can or the vessel in the can then you also have liquid and you have a gas in that can of pop that gas is dissolved in the liquid what happens when we put you in here is all of the liquid in your body, and it's, our body is 70% liquid, approximately, um, can now absorb that gas. The gas is 100% oxygen. So besides just the oxygen being transported by the red blood cells, it's being transported by the plasma and the lymph all through our bodies. So the tissue that's compromised is getting a higher level of oxygen then. Okay. You mentioned the prevention for um, the jaw. Mm -hmm. is, are, do you do any other preventive uh, HBO treatment? As much as I would love to say yes, unfortunately insurance prevents us from doing that. And I, I'm sure you've all heard, like Elizabeth Taylor used to use the hyperbaric oxygen, Michael Jackson used to use hyperbaric oxygen. A lot of the professional sports teams have hyperbaric chambers for um, the healing of sports injuries that they will put their um, players in. Um, however, insurance won't pay for it then. Not for those right. Which indications was that again? For preventative. So you're thinking like if colon, you know, to do it before you go in there. And I don't know that there's any studies that have done that. Oh, not even any studies. Right. What about if there's existing cancers? Is there any danger? I'm going to let Dr. Frischman, why don't you come up here and share this with me? <laughs> um, that's a common question. Um, and there's not been found to be a, a detrimental you know, issue with the hyperbarics, we still kind of are a little shy sometimes about doing it. However, it, it doesn't seem to increase the possibility of like new cancers forming or that cancer propagating because of the oxygen itself. doesn't seem to make it worse. I mean, I, there's, again, I don't know if there's been any kind of side-to-side -side studies with that, but um, we've certainly had people who had cancer, and I mean, this group is all about that. Um, and as far as having cancers come back or recur or uh, a new one form is, is not something that has been found to happen. Um, the theory is there, and that's why sometimes people are shy about doing this, about having somebody go in the tank before, uh, because of it. But there's been nothing that has corroborated this being a problem. Do you, do you treat 
Um, I, then referring patients, and Dr. Frischman kind of alluded to this earlier, um, because the effects of this, the late effects of the radiation may not be, five, you know, until five or ten years later, if it's something like the cystitis or the proctitis, a lot of regular GPs or internists are not familiar with this. They don't know that there's an option, or they may not relate the symptoms back to the radiation. So if you've been cancer free and you're no longer seeing an oncologist or um, the radiation oncologist and you know these symptoms develop years later and you go to your just you know regular doctor, they may not relate it. They may send you to a um, gastroenterologist or a uh, um, proct proctologist. Um, they may not relate the symptoms either, unless you are proactive in saying, I have had so much radiation. I had cancer in this area 10 years ago. I had the radiation. Could this be caused from that radiation? Um, so unless they've had other patients, it's not something that's widely known. Even though hyperbaric oxygen has been around for, what is it, 70 years or something like that? Um, it's not something that is widely known about. I'll tell you that um, probably what's on the radar of most physicians is they've heard of it being used for the jaw. Um, the, the jaw. The, the jaw, you know, this osteoradial necrosis. Um, that's something that they know that they can think back to med school or whatnot. Um, they may understand that radiation may cause cystitis or enteritis, but they probably is not in their memory banks that hyperbaric oxygen is a therapy for those things. Now, again, the facial surgeon would know that, or maybe a lot of gastroenterologists would know that about uh, the intestines, or a urologist may know it about it, about the bladder. But I'm not certain they all have it, you know, like I said, on their radar, so to speak. Yeah. Uh, well, I learned about the flare up in Hawaii. That the radiation wasn't something to pursue. No, that the, 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 uh, the yeah, the, the hyperbaric. Hyper oh, okay. okay. Because there wasn't bleeding. No, no. Oh, I see what you're saying. Um, yeah, so he didn't find infection. He didn't find bleeding. Right. And so your symptoms, he didn't think would be able to be explained by radiation. Right. Okay. I, I mean, well. No, he didn't think that it, they that the HBO would be a benefit to him. I'm he didn't sorry, think that okay. because of the bleeding, because of the lack of bleeding, he didn't think right. that HBO was appropriate. Yeah. And I, I think um, when it is cystitis, probably the most worrisome symptom that people have is bleeding. Um, but that urgency and frequency and this always feeling like you need to go and whatnot, um, that is also something that the hyperbarics can aid in. So, yeah. Right, right. And again, it has to kind of be on their radar. Now, I'll tell you, as an infectious disease doctor, I see a lot of people who have recurrent urinary infections. And some of them aren't. You know, there's other reasons to have cystitis that aren't from infection. And I'll keep getting those cultures and I'll give them antibiotics and they're not better. And, you know, then you go down the, the list of things that might be causing that. And of course, if they had radiation before, and, and perhaps then send them to a chamber. Um, I'm wondering how long the research has been done on the soft tissue, because it sounds like it's much more established with the jaw. Um, and who, who has been doing the research? Like, who, what organizations? Because 
really hard to find any information about radiation damage in the United States. I find it more in Europe. Mm. You seem to be a lot more aware of it in England and in other European countries. Yeah. But in the United States, I can't even find organizations. And I, I don't know how long it's been studied, you know, um, but it, probably the organizations are these, uh, the underwater, um, yeah. hyperbaric underwater, yeah. I I can't, there's, a, there's an acronym for the whole thing, um, but it's, because it's all kind of started with people with the bends, right, right you know, um, so it's the Hyperbaric Underwater Society Medicine, something like that, uh, and if you can find their websites, uh, you'll probably find some information Here, about I, that. I have it. Oh, okay. <laughs> it is Undersea Hyperbaric Medicine, and also the American College of Hyperbaric Medicine. And certain um, universities, I think, uh, looking this up a couple of weeks ago, it was Virginia Mason, apparently has a large department there, and on their website they talk about this and you know, the different treatments that are available. And they'll go into some of the, uh, the theories of why radiation does what it does and why the hyperbarics may help that. So they're up in Seattle, I think. And I just want to point out something also that um, unless because of your insurance you need a referral, you don't need like your GP, your internist to say, yes, this is something that um, would be a treatment for you. The physicians that are at the wound center, we have a variety of physicians. We have internists, Dr. Frischman is infectious disease, we have general surgery, we have plastic surgery, we have podiatry, um, and so when you first come to us, there's going to be a complete physical. And that complete physical is, they're going to ask a lot of questions and what kind of symptoms and things like that before they even say, yes, you're a candidate for hyperbaric. It's not like we just want to put people in there. Um, a full day for us, the capacity is six to eight patients, okay, that we actually dive in a day. However, do we generally have six to eight patients in there? No. Generally, we're at three to four patients per day. Um, and the reason for that is because not everyone qualifies. So we want to make sure that we are doing this for people that it truly will help, people that are not going to be burdened by a huge bill coming either, which is why we do our due diligence to check to make sure that your insurance is going to cover this. Because let's face it, 30 treatments is a lot. So we want to make sure that your insurance will cover that. We want to make sure that you would actually benefit from it. It's a commitment. Not only is it a commitment from us because we're doing it on a daily basis, it's a commitment for the patient. And if that patient can't drive themselves, it may be a commitment on a family member or a friend to drive them every day. So this is definitely something that um, is a benefit, is something that can help many people. However, it is also something that you really kind of have to commit to. Yeah, we've certainly had um, some people referred that we've gone through their data and, and said, you know what, this isn't going to help you. You know, I, I know that's why you came here, but, but we, can't, we can't justify putting you in there for the possible, you know, uh, risks that it does involve. Um, and then there was another woman uh, who had an open wound from her radiation years and years ago. And we talked and talked and talked, and, you know, the family wanted her to try and do this. And she said, you know what, it's okay. I can have this open area. and and get on with my life, and, and it's, it's a discussion. It's not, you know, that somebody's dictating what goes on. And this particular lady it actually does not have one arm because of the radiation and the side effects and everything that had ha happened. They amputated her arm. So a small, what is it, maybe a silver dollar size wound on her collarbone to her is no big deal. To the family, it was a big deal, and the family was pushing, but the patient was saying, I really don't want to do this. So this was not somebody that we were going to put in the tank. If she was that uncomfortable with it, 
even though we probably could have closed that wound with it. But it's, it's not, you know, you have to take that whole patient into consideration. How is it that she lost her arm? Didn't she get you, didn't she get you guys in time? I think it was in India. It, I think it was in India. Yeah. It was over 20 years ago that she originally had it and ended up with such uh, massive lymphedema and then cellulitis that they said the only way they could have treated it was to actually remove her arm. So, so that's why I say she's been without an arm for 20 years and she's okay with that and that little wound wasn't bothering her. It bothered her family more. And this is just a picture of the staff. Yep. Um, we don't have the doctors. We need to take a new picture with all the doctors in it. <laughs> you put the doctor in the chamber. Yeah, we'll put you in the chamber. <laughs> um, so these are just some of the faces that you would see if you did come to the wound center. But, you know, another reason why we're really happy that they were taping this is because, you know, it may not be on somebody's radar right now. But six months from now, maybe you don't have one of these symptoms but maybe a friend of yours does. A family member says, oh, you know what I've been dealing with. Um, so this way, there's a resource. There's somewhere else that you can go for information or refer somebody else for information. And I'll also add, there are several wound centers that have hyperbaric oxygen therapy chambers throughout the Chicagoland area. And our phone number's on there. We're at Holy Family and just claims it 15 to 20 minutes, maybe. Um, from here, but if you call us and say, hey, I, I or somebody lives clear across, we'll, we'll find you a place that's close by. So we're kind of a network. We know who we are, and we, we will definitely connect you with the right place. Is that's this okay. some type of treatment instead of like doing a skin graft or something like that, where they have a wound and they're doing a skin graft and they think this is a raw they could take? Or it may be a combination for the two. You know, in fact, a lot of plastic surgeons are now using hyperbarics to ensure that their flap takes. Some, some of the other indications, and really we're not here to talk about all of those other indications, but some of them are um, chronic osteomyelitis, so chronic um, infection of the bone, um, which Dr. Frischman treats patients with that all the time, and hyperbaric is another indicator, another adjunctive therapy that can be used to treat that. Um, it's not the only thing. They would still be put on antibiotics. This can help it. Um, is it something that they have to do? No, but if they have been on antibiotics and that infection never went away or came back, then the hyperbarics may be the thing that helps to get rid of that um, infection. Another thing is diabetic foot ulcers. Um, if they are so severe that the hyperbarics will help that also. Our biggest client is the diabetic foot ulcer. Yeah. Right. Anything else? Dr. Frischman does a song and dance now. Yeah. <laughs> well, thanks for coming out. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.